Silver is an action RPG released in 1999 by Infogrames, at first on the PC and a year later on the Dreamcast. So it's one of those rare ancient examples of a PC first game that then got ported to a console, not the other way around. I tried to play Silver for several years during the first half of the 2000s, but only managed to play it in short bits and pieces here and there, and unfortunately once I would get a time appropriate PC during the winter of 2004, Silver was very quickly replaced by me wishing to play as many recent titles as possible. So now that I've been looking back at older games, I think it's time to finally play Silver and ask myself, is it a classic? And you might think that the first thing I'll talk about is the graphics, but that is by far not the most particular feature that Silver has to offer. That feature is its combat. It's mouse motion controlled combat. Yep, in Silver you do not simply click and then an attack animation ensues, instead you have to press control and swipe your mouse, up, down, left or right, in order for your chosen character to swing their melee weapons. This is by far the one thing that has stayed with me throughout these past two decades. The one thing that has ensured Silver has a tiny bit of my mind palace reserved forever. As if that wasn't sufficient, the game also differentiates between the various types of melee weapons in terms of how they respond to the different types of attacks. What I mean is that swords will do more damage when lunging with them, since they have a sharp point, while axes will do more damage when you swing with them and less while lunging, since they lack a point of any kind. Once you get a hold of the attack motions, you'd think that the game's a piece of cake going forward. But Silver manages to keep the combat encounters fresh and challenging. On the one hand, it does so because you very quickly fill out your three character party and you'll have to manage all of them in real time, and on the other hand because the camera shifts between entering each new screen, which makes you have to mentally adjust your mouse movement for your character's location and the camera's perspective. You can select any of your party members to play as at any time during combat or outside of combat and this can turn out to be a bit of a bad thing since combat is real time and sometimes a bit of a clusterfuck. So you will definitely end up clicking on your other members by accident during an encounter. The good part is that your character AI is generally decent enough to deal with the average encounter, although when it comes to boss fights you will most likely have to directly control all of them in order to set them in strategic places around the screen. Now going back to the graphics, what can be said about them is that they definitely owe a lot of inspiration to Final Fantasy VII. One could argue they look better since this was released two years after Final Fantasy and I think this approach to early 3D polygons has reached that point where now it's endearing as opposed to hard to look at. But it's not easy on the eye either. What is considerably easier on the eye are the very numerous and obviously pre-rendered 2D backgrounds. The amount of work and rendering time that must have gone into making all of this I'm sure was astounding at the time, and there is a fuck ton of them. Some are simply transition screens where nothing happens, but they look really nice and help build the world of Jara. There is a very anime manga-esque approach to the entire game, as evidenced by the slightly off proportions of the body parts and the general story and world setup. And you can see this influence is deep in the game when you look at the manual and the concept artwork in general. They didn't go full hog with the anime eyes for all of them but it's there, especially in the designs of Silver and Jennifer. Now the voice acting is <laughs> not the best example of the form, but I think slash hope that they went with an overly hammy direction on purpose. Grandad, for instance, is trying for a light Sean Connery, methinks. Now, go into the house and get your blade. Amaze me with your swordsmanship. I'm not as young as I used to be. No, no, I'll leave this magic malarkey to you. Shh. money, penny. I think making the voice acting fairly over the top was a conscious decision because the writing is pretty funny and the entire setup doesn't take itself super seriously. I could have killed you! No, just raised his voice another octave. The action and story are both very fluid and quite intriguing, however there will be some backtracking if you're playing it without a walkthrough. 
Getting around some of the areas is a bit of a time waster since they're basically labyrinths. So better to keep your own map of where goes where the very moment you start into rain. Trust me, it will save you time later. The puzzles aren't difficult. You just need to explore each path from every screen, especially the ones that you start in, <clears throat> talk to everyone you encounter and always, and I mean always, buy whatever weird, strange item or piece of information they're selling. You will definitely need it later. Paying attention to what is being said is useful as well since it can offer hints as to what those NPCs can offer later. Basically to know where to return once you reach a point where something that was mentioned a while back would come in handy. Also making a note of what items you need in order to open doors will help you in the long run as well, especially when you're playing in several sessions. The one puzzle that did give me some grief was the bell puzzle in rain. It's kind of fidgety because it's a timed puzzle and it doesn't really work as it is explained in the game. The breaks between you pulling the bell should be much shorter than a second and there is a tell that will help you at least know if you're doing it right because your character will nod their head if you're doing things properly. Even so, most likely you'll have to do it a couple of times. While there is backtracking, the game also unlocks fast travel fairly early on via a map. And thankfully, fast travel is close to instantaneous and there are lots of marked locations on each part of Jara. So once you know what you need from where, you can get there super fast and back again. But I've been talking a lot about how the game works and referring to locations within the game and did not mention anything about the actual story or who or what Silver is. Well, beginning with the title, Silver is actually the villain of the story. And how often is a PC video game titled after its villain? Almost never. With the exception of Diablo, I cannot think of any other PC title off the top of my head. Silver is a very old and supremely powerful bad wizard who up and decides to kidnap all the ladies in the world. One of those ladies being Jennifer, the protagonist's wife, so he, alongside many other recently single dudes in their village, decide to take matters into their own hands and go save their wives, daughters and mothers. You do this by finding 8 magic orbs that might just give the wielder enough magical power to defeat Silver and his minions. These 8 magic orbs aren't simple MacGuffins, you can use them during your playthrough and you should use them because that's how their respective effects improve. That's another rare thing in most RPGs, you only very rarely get to use the super mythical mystical objects you generally have to collect. Any member of your party can wield them, although it's a good idea to outfit them to the member with most mana. The more they are used, the more they will upgrade in damage and effects. The world of Jara is made up of disparate land masses, each of them seemingly having a particular sort of theme. As mentioned earlier, thankfully, fast traveling between them is super fast and very much not a hassle. While the world initially looks to be firmly fantasy medieval in terms of technological advancement, after spending a bit of time in the game, you discover that there is some relatively advanced technology present as well, at least advanced for the medieval period. And this is a tangent I want to spend a little bit of time on. I love fantasy worlds in which magic exists and it's fairly powerful, I mean the orbs give you some tremendous abilities, but magic also has limits. And that's where science comes in to fill in those gaps. Generally, steampunky science. In this case, in the form of a batis cap or a batis fear. I really enjoy that because it helps cement the goofy nature of the game world. So now cometh the question, what maketh a video game a classic? Some would say it's subjective, some would say it depends. And there's definitely something to be said about subjective classics, which is something I talk about in the series as well. But in order for a game to be an objective classic, it has to be considered to be good over a period of time, has to be remembered as such and also it has to stand up to current day scrutiny. And I also consider that 10 years is the minimum period required for such a hindsight based judgement to take place. In the case of Silver, it's been at least 20 so we're cool. Much like Nox, which was released a year later, Silver came out at a height for RPGs, so it was destined, also like Nox, to be buried by those titles that had much more clout and pedigree than it did. Things like Final Fantasy VIII, 
Baldur's Gate 2 and Diablo 2. And even though it received fairly decent reviews at the time, there were very few of those altogether and it just could not stand out when compared to the titles I just mentioned. Nowadays, it is very much an uber forgotten, I was going to say gem, but that doesn't seem appropriate seeing as how it is named after a precious metal. Let me put it this way. When I made my video about Nox, a couple of friends of mine were like, oh yeah, I remember playing that or I remember the title, man, blast from the past, crazy. When I told them about Silver, their answer was more akin to... So yeah, Silver is a forgotten title's forgotten title. So even though it was well reviewed at the time of release, I can say that it has been very well remembered, so it really cannot be an objective classic, but it's definitely a subjective classic for yours truly. Silver may look a bit tarnished after 2 plus decades, but it still shines underneath it all. It has successfully retained its value. And for those of you who are retro console gamers out there, I know there are at least a couple of you watching, Silver was also released on the Dreamcast. So if you're a Dreamcast owner and don't have it yet, put it on your list as I'm pretty sure you won't regret it. Let me know in the comments if you've ever heard of Silver or if you've actually played it. Curious to find out. Hey there dear watcher who's still watching, thank you very much for sticking around. I've recently started a Patreon page, so if you want to and can throw a couple of bucks my way to help me get more games and improve my recording setup, go on there and check out the tiers and rewards. If you can do that but still want to help me grow my channel, please consider subscribing, turning on the notification bell and of course sharing the video far and wide. I've been Stephen Nonsense, thank you very much for watching, see you next time and have a great rest of the day.